firstborn son. This is the story of their complex relationship. Charles tried to be a more modern parent, but he didn't have the tools because he didn't grow up with them. A shared tragedy defined this father and son. There's this marvellous picture of Harry holding very, very tight to Prince Charles's hand for support. For years, they were close. <laughs> Until a shocking interview exposed the cracks in their relationship. Trapped within the system, like the rest of my family are. These are seismic statements to make. Charles Huda felt very exposed by his son. Tonight, royal insiders explain how this relationship fell apart. He said it was the most terrible thing to make William and I walk behind our mother's coffin. It should not have been allowed. The damage is done. The relationship that I knew can never be like that again. Prince Philip's funeral was an opportunity for reconciliation, but what really happened? I think you could see clearly at the funeral how emotional Prince Charles was. Part of that was the problems with his relationship with Harry. And what lasting effect will this royal rift have on the House of Windsor? Of course Harry wants to protect his wife, but is it at the expense of bringing down his own family? Tonight we ask, Will Charles and Harry ever repair their damaged relationship? There's no doubt the gulf between Charles and Harry has widened considerably. It will be very difficult to bridge that divide uh, in future. I can't see how they can do it. March 2021. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex sit down with Oprah Winfrey for an explosive and revealing interview. It will rock the foundations of the royal family. Please explain how you, Prince Harry, raised in a palace, in a life of privilege, literally a prince, how you were trapped. Trapped within the system, like the rest of my family are. My father and my brother, they are trapped. Harry's claims exposed the unhappiness of the couple's life behind palace walls. They also revealed the full extent of his estrangement from his family, particularly his father. The person that was really sort of knocked to the ground in that interview with several punches was Prince Charles. 100%. The takeaway from that interview was that there is a real rift, there is real distance, there is real anger. You could see that it was difficult for Harry to speak about his relationship with his family, but at the same time he wanted to. He wanted to get a message through that he has struggled deeply with what's been going on and there are definite fractures in the relationship. These are seismic statements to make about one's own family members. And I wonder whether from Charles's point of view, he would have felt very exposed by his son. The Sussexes interview with Oprah had echoes of another controversial royal interview, which took place in the 1990s, when Prince Charles spoke frankly about the state of his marriage and confessed to cheating on his wife, Princess Diana. Did you try to be faithful and honourable to your wife when you took on the vow of marriage? Yes, absolutely. And you were? Yes. Until it became irretrievably broken down. In the back of Charles' mind, there would have been a certain amount of guilt because <laughs> would have brought up memories of his own attempt way back in 1994 to, to get the media on his side. So on the one hand, he was being criticised by Harry and was probably very upset by that. But on the other hand, it's very difficult for me to sort of attack him for doing something which, which I myself did, you know, when I was young. Every single time anybody agrees to one of these huge interviews, they're doing it for one reason and one reason only. 
They're doing it to put their side across because they assume that when they have done that, everybody will be on their side and love them even more. And we've seen so many times in the past how mistaken that can be. While Charles's interviews stunned the world in the 1990s, his son's revelations may have gone a step further and hurt those closest to him, including his father. There's no doubt the gulf between Charles and Harry has widened considerably. I mean, I think if they're not careful, it will be very difficult to bridge that divide in future. I can't see how they can do it. Grant Harold was a former butler to Prince Charles. He witnessed firsthand the loving bond the royal father and son once had, which has now seemingly been lost. The damage is done, and that makes me sad because the relationship that I knew, which was a loving, caring, fun relationship, can never be like that again. Prince Harry's decision to speak so candidly was a dramatic move. To understand why it happened, we must return to the beginning of Harry's life and consider events that took place soon after he was born. 15th of September, 1984. Well-wishers around the world celebrated the birth of the Prince and Princess of Wales' second son. He was known to his family as Harry and his father was acknowledged in his full given name, Henry Charles Albert David Windsor. I remember at the christening, they were both looking incredibly happy. William was a tearaway, he was running around like mad, but Harry was quiet and peaceful. In public, Charles and Diana were delighted by Harry's arrival, but in private, they're said to have clashed over how to raise their sons. Diana wanted them to experience the real world with a degree of freedom, a concept that Charles may have struggled with. Diana would, you know, take them to what became a favorite was Bill Wyman, the Rolling Stones' Sticky Fingers in Kensington Church Street. The prince had a slight problem with it because I remember once when they came back, there was this look of horror across the prince's face because he couldn't actually work out why with a, with a brigade of good chefs at Kensington Palace, you know, that dino would have to take them for a burger. Prince Charles tried hard to be close to his sons, but the formality of his own royal upbringing meant he wasn't the hands-on parent that Diana was. Charles didn't receive any parenting. His parents were away when he was very young. He was left with nannies in that very Victorian way. Granny was christened in this. And although Charles tried to be a more modern parent, he didn't have the tools because he didn't grow up with them. Looks remarkably well despite it. Some say that Charles's reserved parenting style made him a distant presence in Prince Harry's life. Although Charles is very sensitive and very caring, he never really could show it in the same way as Diana. And Charles was a huge workaholic. Charles wouldn't just stop his work just because he had his sons for a day. Whereas I think with Diana, she always made sure that everything was done for them. Diana, she actually joined in their games. Whereas Charles would have said, off you go. He wouldn't have joined in. He's too stiff, he's too old fashioned. Charles and Harry's relationship was already strained, but then the family suffered the ultimate tragedy and decisions would be made that would affect their father and son bond forever. He said it was the most terrible thing to make William and I walk behind our mother's coffin. It should not have been allowed. When Prince Harry was born, he and his brother William grew up initially in a happy family unit. But there were growing signs of tension between their parents. Diana said that during her pregnancy, she and Charles got on better than they had any, at any other time, but that it all went wrong after Harry was born. 
If these marital struggles created a distance between Charles and his young son, things were about to get worse. It is announced from Buckingham Palace that with regret, the Prince and Princess of Wales have decided to separate. This decision has been reached amicably and they will both to continue to participate fully in the upbringing of their children. In 1992, Harry's parents went through a very public breakup. The eight-year-old now struggled as he was bounced between Charles's Highgrove estate and Diana's Kensington Palace apartment. What a child wants is stability, structure, and love from their parents. And that, that kind of constancy gives children a sense of safety. If they're going between two separate households, that can feel very destabilizing for, for a young child. So suddenly Prince Harry was shuttling between the more relaxed, much more familiar household of Princess Diana and then the more dutiful, strict, timetabled household of Prince Charles. There was this sort of natural gravitation towards Diana, simply because Diana was the provider of the fun things that, that boys at that age actually wanted. Charles, interesting enough, acknowledged that William and Harry were both happier and engaged when in the company of their mother. And in that respect, one has to uh, applaud the Prince of Wales because he could see that his children were happier in those early days with their mother rather than him. Harry was caught between the world of royal formality set out by his father and the more carefree mindset of his beloved mother. We have reports from Paris that Diana, Princess of Wales, has been killed in a car accident. Prince Harry had been with his father at Balmoral when the news broke of his mother's death in August 1997. Prince Charles tried to offer his young son the support he needed. Charles had this huge responsibility to protect the boys. And there's this marvelous picture of Harry leaning down to look at the notes and the flowers, holding very, very tight to Prince Charles's hand for support. It's a very, very moving moment, I think. In the immediate aftermath of Princess Diana's death, Prince Charles was very protective of his sons. He was determined that William and Harry would be shielded from speculation, from the press, from intrusion, and from people looking at their grief. At the funeral, however, it was a different story. Watched by an estimated 2.5 billion people around the world, the private mourning of Diana's sons was on full public display. Princess Diana's funeral was one of the, and I say this as someone who was there, it was one of the most extraordinary things, I think, in the last century. It was a sort of maelstrom of grief, of astonishment, of public display. Well, in the middle of all this, this vast sea of passion and emotion and public mourning was a little boy. What we saw was the boys taking on the duty role. We see them doing their job, walking behind their mother's coffin. It is a deeply personal loss. And then to find yourself in this arena, surrounded by people openly grieving, weeping, throwing flowers, wanting to touch you, robs them of their own private grief. The royal family are very good at knowing what the public want. They're very good at putting on a show. They served up their grief in a ceremonial way that satisfied the millions. Prince Harry must have felt like a fish in a goldfish bowl being stared at by the entire world, probably at the absolute worst point of his entire life. In later years, the adult Prince Harry would reveal his discomfort about the role he had played. It raised questions about why Prince Charles allowed his sons to be so exposed on such a traumatic day. I went to Kensington Palace 
and um, for a, a, an interview with Prince Harry. And we were making sort of politish conversation and he suddenly stopped, it was very silent. And then he said, it was the most terrible thing to make William and I walk behind our mother's coffin. Um, it should not have been allowed. This went worldwide because he'd not really spoken about that before. And looking back on that terrible, tragic day, you realize that he was absolutely right. Clearly, it was a traumatic moment for him. Clearly, it's something he wouldn't make any child do himself. Clearly, he remembers it. So there's always a struggle for Prince Harry and indeed for Prince William between how they feel as bereaved sons and what they have to do as public figures. In the years following Diana's death, Charles tried hard to fill the void she left by embracing life as a single parent. Prince Harry's energy and enthusiasm delighting the press and his father, though a request for a closer look at those brightly coloured mini skis was politely declined. <laughs> the extraordinary thing straight after Princess Diana's death is the behaviour and the actions of Prince Charles. He stepped up his parenting game, his parenting skills. He became a very much a full on and hands on father for those boys. Prince Charles arranged for the Spice Girls to meet Harry. And for a 12 year old, this was beyond exciting and they were very nice to him. They cuddled him, they had lots of pictures. And he said to his dad afterwards that it's, you know, one of the best days of my life meeting them. So he did try, although he might be, seem to be a bit square, the Spice Girls at the time were all the thing. And he did try and do something that would please Harry and give him a few moments of happiness. Charles made enormous efforts um, to do a lot more for the boys, to spend more time with them, to go to various events with them. And that was all to the good. I think that worked very well. Following the breakdown of his marriage to Diana, Charles's standing with the public had been at an all-time low. Just a few years later, he was becoming a hit with the world's media. Charles was under so much pressure. He'd been criticised so much through the disintegration of his marriage to Diana. He was very self-consciously promoting this idea of him as being close to the two boys. This was really to try and overturn the earlier image of him as, as cold and aloof while Diana was warm and fun. Oh. <laughs> I remember the footage from the skiing trip and it looks adorable. And then you've got dozens, if not hundreds, of official world's media photographing them and lobbing questions at them. My arms aren't long enough to get around. <laughs> and making sure that all those lovely fatherly, father and son smiles are captured. <laughs> There's always been a huge desire from the press to have photos of Charles and Harry and William. Charles's attitude was very much give them a bit of what they want and then they'll leave us alone. But I'm not sure that Harry was ever as comfortable with that. Unknown by the media, the young Prince Harry's frustrations with royal life were growing. This was compounded by the death of his mother, whom he believed had been hounded by the press. When Princess Diana died, Harry was only 12. As time passed, of course, you're gonna start questioning why did she die? Who caused the death? And we can see that from Harry that he does absolutely blame the press. And it's something that has really stoked a real fire of anger, if you like, towards the press. And I think fast forward a few years later, that's when we really start to see Harry's, in a sense, acting out, but who can blame him? As Harry grew from a vulnerable young prince mourning his mother into a rebellious teenager, stories of his nighttime escapades became regular front page news. 
Harry's teens, by his own admission, were very troubled time for him, smoking and drinking too much, getting into trouble at school, cries for attention. It was one thing after another. They still upset me and I still read them. Why, I do not know, but I have to read them just for peace of mind, just to know what they've written and to see who, who wrote it and see who took the photographs, you know, write that down and down for later. When I was there, it was very much the days of when Harry was kind of called the, the kind of party prince. I remember on occasions, like on a Sunday morning, there'd be whatever Harry had been up to the night before, we'd be in the press. And then obviously I'd see him and I'd say to him, well, you had a, had a good night then, kind of thing. And we'd have a, I'd have a laugh and luckily he would have a chuckle and he'd go, maybe, you know, kind of thing. In 2002, newspapers revealed Harry had been caught smoking drugs and drinking underage in pubs near his father's home, Highgrove in Gloucestershire. For Charles, this was one misdemeanor too many. He sent his son for a day's visit to a drug rehabilitation center. The palace viewed this with alarm. I mean, I think they always do because anything that's out of control inevitably is damaging, especially for Charles, because it, it, it reflected badly on him as a parent. Prince Charles has got a lot of support today, not least because this is a situation that thousands of parents in Britain have faced. He insisted Harry should visit a drug rehabilitation centre. I think the idea was that it, it would give him a shock. He would go there and see, you know, what, what it was like if you allowed drugs to sort of take over your life. I suspect Prince Charles did that because in the eyes of the public, that's what the public wanted to see or felt that they that he should do. But at the end of the day, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, rebellious children <laughs> who in normal families will do a little bit of underage drinking. So I think it's what do we need to show the public that we're doing in order to sort of hone in this behavior. Did this attempt at intervention by Prince Charles offer his son the support he really needed? I wonder whether, if that's the case, Harry would have felt, you know, short-changed. You know, what I really need, Dad, is a lot of love, attention, structure. I need more face-to-face -face time with you because I'm struggling. This is a cry for help. I need you as my parent to step in and help me. So there might have been some tension around what was happening at this point in time. This would not be the last time Prince Charles would need to step in and make a critical decision in his son's life. It was a bit unfortunate because it was another example of Charles the father doing something that Harry the son didn't like. One reason for the decline in the complex father-son relationship between Prince Charles and Harry is the difference in their approach to life and to their royal roles. Both men were shaped by their formative experiences at school. Charles was given a tough, formal education that emphasized duty. He was a sensitive, vulnerable child who was put through this most appalling education to try and toughen him up. From the age of 13, Charles was sent to Gordonston School in northeast Scotland, just as his father had been before him. But the tough regime was ill-suited to the sensitive prince. Prince Charles called it colditz in kilts, and like a prison sentence. It just wasn't for him. Prince Charles was bullied at school from end to end. He was completely and utterly solidly miserable for the entirety of his time there. By contrast, Harry's school days at Eton were more sedate. Not as academic as his father, he was certainly more popular. Charles likes book learning. He wants to get the answers to his questions by going to the library and studying. Prince Harry's energy is really the opposite. Prince Harry is not shy and retiring or stiff or staid. He's not crusty or dusty. He is naturally athletic. He's naturally outdoorsy. Harry said that he decided very firmly that he wanted to mix with the bad boys and he played lots of tricks. While Charles attended Cambridge University, 
Harry's modest academic record did not push him into higher education, yet both father and son spent time in the armed forces, developing their sense of duty. Um, exam's never been my favorite, and I always knew that I was going to find it harder than most people, but I'm through that now, and uh, finally got hands on to a job that I absolutely adore. It is still hard work, but I'm better than William, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Going into the military is actually quite traditional for male members of the royal family. You do your stint in the military. It's a very 18th century idea. Prince Charles and Prince William did their years in the military, but they didn't make it their identity. As heirs to the throne, Charles and William have special roles. Whereas Harry saw in the armed forces an opportunity to create his own identity and purpose. If they said, no, you can't go front line, then I wouldn't drag my sorry ass through Sandhurst. He could forget about himself as a royal. He could forget about the press intrusion. It was as if his army experience gave him what the drugs and the drinking had given him when he was a bit younger. We know that his army colleagues loved him. They barely can even think of him as sort of a prince. He's just hairy to them. He's one of them. Even as Harry's service career thrived, the interest shown by the press was growing intense. His father tried to help. At that point, Harry was third in line to the throne, so a massive target for any enemy to want to take him out. The first time was under absolute secrecy, and Charles was, was very much involved in that. And he spoke to the MOD, he spoke to the head of the army, and they all came up with this plan to deploy him, but to keep everything secret so no one knew. When he was deployed to the front line in Helmand in December 2007, even his butler was unaware. When he went to Afghanistan, that was extraordinary. I mean, at that point, I thought we knew where they were. We didn't know. It didn't stay a secret for long. The prince on the front line, Harry on active service in Afghanistan. He's been secretly deployed for 10 weeks, fighting shoulder to shoulder with his fellow soldiers in the war against the Taliban. Prince Harry's return became inevitable as soon as a news blackout of his presence in the country was broken by the foreign press. The Taliban made it clear that they would make extra efforts to either kill or capture the royal prince. For his own protection and for all the soldiers around him had to fly back very quickly after only 10 weeks and he was utterly devastated. He was furious. This was the happiest time of his life, the time when he felt he really belonged and was making a difference and was on a career path that suited him and that he could make the most out of and make a real difference. And again, he blamed the press. Every time he's trying to be himself, whether that's as a soldier or a young guy that wants to smoke a joint and hang out with his friends, the press gets onto it and that's another thing he just can't do. I think that came next to losing his mother, really, that he'd lost what he loved to do and where he loved to be, and what was there left for him. Harry seemed to hold the press responsible for his mother's death and for the curb on his service career. Then he discovered that his father was involved too. It's unfortunate for Charles that he was implicated in the decision to recall his son because it was another example of Charles the father doing something that Harry the son didn't like. Harry must have been saying, look, here we go again. Are my father and the world's media actually working together? The next one in a long line of emotional betrayals that have come from the people who are really the closest to him. In fact, Charles's involvement in removing Harry from the theater of conflict was motivated by a desire to protect his son. And as a parent, you worry the whole time. I think if you're out here, perhaps you know, you're getting on with everything, it's not the same, but I, for everybody left behind, it's, it's ghastly. From Charles's point of view, as a parent, he would have been in protection mode. And as the son, he would have been, trust me, I know what I'm doing, don't interfere. So typically that would have brought its own internal tensions between father and the son. 
Harry is aware that his father loves him and wants to do his best for him, but then these other things all intrude and slightly poison the atmosphere. You know, because Charles obviously felt you know, we have to do the right thing here. But Harry's idea of the right thing was very different. It's obviously a great relief, as far as I'm concerned, to, to see him home in, in, uh, in one piece. Eventually, father and son buried the hatchet. Harry's recall from Afghanistan inspired him to take on a new role, and one that would make his father proud. That was a pivotal moment, probably one of the most significant days in Harry's life, because on that plane that brought him back was a dead soldier. I thought there was a coffin on the plane, and there were two or three British soldiers returning who'd lost limbs. And it was very soon after this that Harry set up the Invictus Games. In 2014, Harry played a pivotal role in organizing the Invictus Games, which today involves 500 competitors from across 20 nations. For Prince Harry, the army is where the heart is. He's long been a champion for wounded service personnel, and today he was playing sitting volleyball, one of the sports at the Invictus Games. Harry's dedication to celebrating the bravery of wounded service personnel was all too clear from his speech at the Games opening ceremony. The admiration I have for these men and women to move beyond their injuries is limitless. Your stories move, inspire and humble us. You prove that anything is possible if you have the will. Welcome to the Games. Welcome to Invictus. It was to prove a golden period for a now united father and son. Charles was very, very proud of Harry. What parent wouldn't be proud of their child coming through and blossoming and showing real confidence, real purpose, creating something that embraces a huge community? That is a huge step forward. I think it was also a way for him to bring his parents together. So. From my father, I've got a sense of duty, a sense of continuity, a sense of my responsibility as a royal. I'm not going to be the rebel anymore. And then from his mother, he has the human rights aspect, the international aspect, the charity aspect. And those two things fused together really powerfully, and they're still fused together. Much as his mother did with AIDS patients and people injured because of mines being planted in conflicts, Harry realised that this spoke to him in a special way. There have been many low points in the relationship between Charles and Harry. The high point, the, the, the bit that, will, that will all, they will both always remember as a point in time where they came very close, that would be the success of the Invictus Games. I mean, it was almost like, you know, father and son finally found something that would lock them together. With his father's blessing, Harry helped turn the Invictus Games into an international success story, giving a powerful voice to thousands of injured service men and women around the world. Harry was now making a positive contribution to the royal family and to wider society. Father and son were now more aligned than ever before, and Harry was soon invited to take on further public duties. Prince Harry was a different type of royal. He was a royal just like his mother, very hands-on. Prince Harry has never wanted to just do the service and the duty that a royal member you know, must do by simply arriving at an event, giving a speech, waving, and leaving. He wanted to take on more active roles, being very, very hands-on, dancing, hugging, you can't sit there with a stiff up and look with your crossed, crossed arms and not get involved. We knew from the start that these countries were going to be fantastic fun. I've never taken myself too seriously. There's a real contrast between Prince Charles and Prince Harry when they do their royal tours. Wherever they are in the world, Prince Charles does it blatantly as duty. So he's there and wherever he is, even if it's like 100 degrees outside, he's wearing a very closed suit that's completely buttoned up. And he smiles and nods and waves, and he's jovial, but he's still a little bit stiff. <laughs> 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 
I think you would be, wouldn't you? You would be <laughs> washed by all you lot. Anyway. Prince Harry on international royal tours is clearly having a really good time. We see Harry as much more at ease in his own skin. He had a good template in how he saw his mother behave and where, you know, he's hanging out with Usain Bolt and, and he's meeting people and he feels good about himself. This was Golden Harry, the bloke that everyone wanted to go and have a drink with, the bloke that all girls wanted to go and have a flirt with. He was that kind of the action Jackson superhero that had served his country and kind of could do no wrong. Charles and Harry were very close, probably as close as they've, they've ever been. There's a famous Oscar Wilde quote which says about children and their parents, it says, um, first we love our parents, then we judge them, sometimes we forgive them. For three decades, Charles and Harry's relationship had been subject to intense strains, but at last it seemed they were moving on and putting the past behind them, as this illuminating interview with Prince Charles from 2018 suggests. Your children always surprise you, really, because you think they pull your leg all the time and appear not to pay any attention at all. In fact, you then later discover perhaps they... Dude, good Lord, don't tell me you actually listened or... The relationship between Harry and Charles has suffered since 2018. So, from a wedding to a breakup, how did Harry's marriage to actress Meghan Markle lead to father and son going their separate ways? Charles admired the fact that Harry was trying to protect Meghan, but I think he was very worried that it, it would have unintended consequences, which of course it did. I remember getting this email on my phone and my jaw dropped. Royal history shows that affairs of the heart often clash with responsibilities of the role. In the case of Prince Charles and Prince Harry, adding a love interest to an already complicated father-son relationship had the potential to make matters worse. This is a repeating pattern over generations in the royal family. We've seen it with Charles, Diana and Camilla. That tension between wanting to be with the person you love being in a family business and also being a member of a family. Harry was just 10 years old when his father shocked the world and described the tensions in his marriage to Princess Diana, as well as his own adultery in a frank TV interview. I have on the whole tried, I think, to, to get it right. I mean, constantly, people scrutinizing. So, I mean, it, 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 I have always tried to get it right, tried to do the, the right thing by everybody. So you can imagine, it's, it's, not, it's not a very um, happy or encouraging thing when this sort of business happens. So when his own sons started dating, it seems Charles advised them to choose their ideal partners based on love rather than any other considerations. Prince Charles believed that unlike what happened to him where he was almost forced into a marriage and the wife had to be a virgin, he was determined that Prince Harry and Prince William could find someone who they loved and who they wanted to marry. Harry had two big previous relationships before Meghan, so Chelsea Davy and of course Cressida Bonas. But while they appeared happy on the arm of the dashing prince, they weren't so keen to become princesses. Chelsea was like, absolutely not. I don't want to be in the public eye. I don't want to be written about in papers. And the same thing with Cressida. We know that both of those girls ended that relationship because they did not want this life in the public eye by being uh, married into a, a senior member of the royal family. Eventually, Harry did find the love of his life and royal reporters are still kicking themselves that they didn't spot the signs. It's all very formal, obviously, when you're covering the royals, and there we were in one of the very smart rooms in Buckingham Palace, and Harry came bounding over, saying, Hi, Em, how are you doing? We're like, you're tanned, or is it burnt? And he said, yeah, I know. Africa was amazing. Oh, it was so good. I thought, wow, Harry's in a good mood. Like, I had never seen him quite so animated and quite so happy. 
And that was about six weeks before the news broke that he was dating Meghan Markle. And of course, one of their first dates had been in Botswana. Harry and Meghan's romance was embraced by the royal family. In that happy time, there was no sign of any tension between father and son. They welcomed Meghan with open arms. Prince Charles admired the fact that she was self-made. Charles, he's slightly obsessed with the idea that somehow you've got to retain the magic of the royal family, but you've got to modernise. And what better way than to welcome a woman who's not only divorced, but American and of mixed race. And I remember the Queen invited both Meghan and Harry to Sandringham, which is a huge thing because couples, unless you were married, you just didn't get invited. They liked her very much, but of course, it didn't take the press long to start writing things about Meghan, to do the sort of things that would make Meghan worry, but also the royal family worry. Newspapers were soon filled with opinion on whether Meghan was a good fit for the royal family. Whilst initially there was a huge amount of admiration and uh, hero worship when Meghan first came on the scene, there were some media outlets that ran some really disgraceful articles with headlines about straight out of Compton or exotic DNA, very old fashioned opinions borderline racist opinions. And the trouble is that one article like that is one too many. Meghan, we've discovered, has a very, very thin skin. But we have to remember that um, Kate did. They used to call her Weighty Katie. She had a terrible time. And Camilla had a dreadful time in people accusing her of causing Diana's death. I know Camilla spoke to her and they had lunch together, tried to help her get used to things and give perhaps some of her own experiences so that she wouldn't feel that she was being targeted. The royal family may have been reassuring Meghan behind the scenes but it's their standard practice not to complain in public about press treatment. By apparently not speaking up for Meghan, Charles seemed to find himself taking a very different path to Harry. Statements started coming out saying, you need to lay off my girlfriend, Meghan Markle. These underlying racial tones need to stop. I remember getting this email on my phone, my jaw dropped, actually, because press statements from the royal family are normally really bland and really boring. I mean, this was Harry, anger. The anger was leaping off the page with his words and the tone. This was an unprecedented move, really just instructing the press to back off and leave Meghan alone. Charles admired the fact that Harry was trying to protect Meghan, but I think he was very worried that it, it would have unintended consequences, which of course it did. Handling the press is like handling jelly night. You know, it's almost impossible to do it safely. Despite Harry's insistence on tackling the press, his relationship with his father appeared stronger than ever. He felt able to ask Charles to play a significant role at his wedding. Meghan's father infamously didn't come to the UK for her wedding um, because he said he had heart problems and he, he was in hospital. There was the question of who would walk Meghan down the aisle. Prince Harry asked to his father and what could be better than having the heir to the British throne walk your beautiful bride down the aisle. He proffered his arm, she took it. He says, you look lovely. She said, thank you. And they process up to the altar and there's Harry. And he turns to Charles and he says, thanks, Pa. It's such a touching moment between father and son. He's so proud of his soon-to-be wife, but also so proud of his father, w literally welcoming Meghan into the royal family in such a kind way. This was a very important symbolic act in terms of optics that, you know, Meghan is now part of our royal family. A marriage is when two families come together. It's not when two individuals come together. In this case, it's also when two different mindsets, two different worlds come together. 
the harmony of that happy wedding would soon be strained by revelations in the press. It immediately took a turn for the worse with reports coming out that she made Kate cry, how she is demanding and pushy. You've got elements of people within their household quitting. You're almost to the point like, what's true, what's not true, but certainly these can't all, all be untrue, can they? I personally began to see the wheels coming off. Harry was absolutely furious at the leaks, at what was being written. Everyone who knows anything about the press, the more angry you get, the bigger the story. The only way to do it is simply to ignore the press. And of course, Harry was never going to do that. For Harry, the press persecution of his wife was a flashback to the media hounding of his mother 20 years earlier. As he pointed out in the documentary, Harry and Meghan, an African journey. And part of any job, like everybody, um, means putting on a brave face and turning a, turning a cheat to a lot of the stuff. Um, but again, for me and for, and for my wife, you know, there's a, there's a, of course there's a lot of stuff that hurts, um, especially when the majority of it is untrue. I will, you know, I will not, I will not be bullied <laughs> into, into, into playing a game that, that killed my mum. So I will always protect my family, and now I have a family to protect. So he's now thinking, oh my God, the curse is coming around again. It's happening again, one generation on. So decades have passed, but nothing's changed. Everything that she went through and what happened to her is incredibly raw every single day. And that's not me being paranoid. That's just me not wanting a repeat of, of the past. Harry's perception is that his mother wasn't protected. She wasn't safe when she died. She was being pursued by the paparazzi. She didn't have the security detail that she deserved. If, if only she'd had what she needed, she may have made it. If Harry harboured a belief that Charles could have done more to protect Diana, Resentment would certainly have resurfaced when his father chose not to defend Meghan publicly. Harry, he was like, enough is enough. I'm not standing for this anymore. And he also couldn't understand, and indeed she couldn't understand, why members of his family, particularly his father, were not standing up and saying, you know what, this is unacceptable. Father and son may have been at odds, but the famously close relationship between William and Harry still seemed unbreakable. Every year we get closer. The one person on this earth who I can actually really, you know, we can talk about anything and we understand each other and we give each other support. Yet by 2019, even this sibling bond was under strain and the world had its first hint of another royal rift. We'll always be brothers. Um, we're certainly on different paths at the moment, but I will always be there for him, and as I know, he'll always be there for me. As brothers, you know, you have good days, you have bad days. We know over the last several years, really since he married Meghan, that the relationship between William and Harry has been very rocky indeed. Prince Harry's determination to defend his wife whilst his father and brother stayed silent seemed to drive a wedge through the family. Protecting his marriage and protecting his wife were his number one priorities. We know that many members of the royal family feel that service and duty to the crown and to the royal family are their number one priorities. And there's a clear difference there. It's sad for me because when I was there, knowing how close all three were, they were, they were a team. And then came a bombshell revelation that would lead to the biggest split in the royal family for 80 years. Can you put up with this? Was it surprising to them? Probably not. Were they happy about it? Definitely not. In September 2019, Harry and Meghan were on a 10-day tour of Africa, where they appeared to be embracing their royal roles. The messaging was positive, and I think from Charles's point of view, in terms of the brand royal family, they did a phenomenally good job. I am here with you as a mother, as a wife, 
as a woman, as a woman of color, and as your sister. Behind the scenes, Meghan was struggling to cope with the burden of royal life. During the filming of an ITV documentary about the trip, she made a momentous decision to speak out. The interview with Tom Bradby was a surprise to everybody, but obviously to the royal family in particular. Perhaps you could just give us an idea of what the last year has been like. It's... It's, um... hard. Thank you for asking, because not many people have asked if I'm okay. But it's, um... Uh, it's a very real thing to be going through behind the scenes. And the answer is, would it be fair to say not really? Okay, as in it's really been a struggle. Yes. That interview was pivotal, and certainly with hindsight, you can see that something changed at that minute. That would have been a dig at the royal family. And I think that was definitely eye-opening to everybody around the world saying, okay, something's going on here with the royal family. I think it was clear from that interview on that alarm bells were starting to ring for Prince Charles about what path Harry and Meghan were going down and where it was going to end. Finally, the tensions between Harry and Charles reached breaking point. Three months after Harry and Meghan returned from their tour, it was announced that they would step down as senior members of the royal family. In the run-up to Harry and Meghan leaving, uh, leaving royal duties and then leaving the country, um, there were frantic conversations. Um, I think Charles was desperate for his son not to do anything rash. I think Harry felt, oh, here again, my father's trying to stop me being free. Charles has clearly wanted to help Harry to stay within the royal family. It's a huge monarchy. You can't just say, right, you can go tomorrow. There's lots of um, complications to senior royals leaving. And the Queen and Prince Charles were working out how to do this. Harry then published an announcement on his Instagram page, sparking a worldwide media frenzy. We had Harry announcing you know, that he wanted to step back, the Queen responding. The Queen shouldn't be responding, it should really be the other way around. Pretty much at every stage, they seemed to jump the gun. They seemed to do things out of order, to not follow proper etiquette. I think ultimately that's how the relationship between Harry and Charles broke down. It is one of the biggest um, constitutional crises to hit the, the family because this suddenly saw a massive breakdown in communication between senior members of the family. So it was clear there was something seriously wrong. I think Charles was pretty devastated by the departure for a number of reasons. He'd lost a son, he'd been unable to protect that young couple and keep them within the fold and keep them working for the royal family. Prince Charles had committed himself to a life of royal service, but his son was stepping away from his. Inevitably, this created a further divide between them. The motto is almost duty first and all the other stuff follows. Now, when you now live in a world where you start to put your own needs and wants ahead of duty, this is where the tensions arise because the rest of the family is saying, well, this is a business. Charles knew over the years how unpopular it's been to have the royal family too big, too costly, too many members who nobody's ever heard of. So he wanted to slimline the royal family. So it was no surprise when his son wanted not only to be not a working royal anymore, but to be half in, half out, that was never going to wash. It seems yet again that Harry didn't receive the support he'd hoped for. You've got here the tension between being a parent and also the child's boss. And here's where the boundaries get very blurry and very messy. His withdrawal from royal duty was never going to be easy. 
But the sacrifice Harry had to make was far greater than he imagined. He has lost his royal titles. He's lost security privileges. He's lost a lot of money and patronage. He lost all of his military appointments, which he worked for 10 years to build up. When Harry first spoke out about the decision, he expressed his disappointment that his family were unable to compromise. It brings me great sadness that it has come to this. Our hope was to continue serving the Queen, the Commonwealth and my military associations, but without public funding. Unfortunately, that wasn't possible. I think he'd have found it upsetting because he doesn't just do them because it's, it's duty, it's because he's passionate. He loves these things. For Charles, as with the Queen, the monarchy always comes first. Harry seemed to struggle with this idea. Charles will have known that that was going to damage their relationship, but he will have put what he saw as the greater good of the monarchy and the royal family above his personal relationship with his son. Once again, Charles's silence was deafening, but there was a high price to pay. The rift between father and son was growing, and soon the whole world would know about it. Prince Charles loves Harry, but there comes a time when you have to say, enough is enough, and that was it. Will you, will you miss Harry and Meghan? In February 2021, nearly a year after Meghan and Harry stepped back from their royal roles, it was announced that their move would be permanent. Weeks later, Harry made the pivotal decision to appear on global television and discuss the issues he has with his father in front of an estimated audience of 60 million. When we were in Canada, I I had uh, three conversations with my grandmother and two conversations with my father um, before he stopped taking my calls. So you just said that your dad stopped taking your calls. Why did he stop taking your calls? Because I took matters in, by that point, I took matters into my own hands. There was never ever a time when I worked for Prince Charles and, and William and Harry that I would never be told not to put a phone call through from the boys to their father. But this is how serious it has become that he doesn't want to answer the calls of his son. We're told the reason that Charles stopped taking his calls because Harry kept asking for more money. Charles is not someone who likes confrontation, so effectively, he just stopped taking his calls. Charles doesn't have a mobile phone, so it is just literally um, phoning the switchboard and asking to be put through to wherever he is. Prince Charles loves Harry, but there comes a time when you have to say, enough is enough, and that was it. And they, they got back talking on the phone um, a short while afterwards. Harry also disclosed that Charles had put an end to the private funding he was providing for his son. My family literally cut me off financially and I had to afford, afford security for, for us. I suspect it was that bit of the interview which upset Charles the most, that he felt very let down by that public criticism. Traditionally, before Harry stopped being working royal, he would have only got about 5% of his income from the sovereign grant. The other 95% would have been from his father's personal wealth and from the Duchy of Cornwall. Charles was paying about £5 million a year for Kate, William, Harry and Meghan. That's a significant amount of money. That money pretty much disappeared when Harry and Meghan moved to Canada and then to the United States. And that's where the problem arises. Harry slightly feels that um, not giving him the money he wants is not giving him the love he wants. Harry, he's got 30 million, most of it from his mother, but also a considerable amount from uh, the Elizabeth the Queen mother. So he's not exactly what you would call poor. One issue raised in the interview seemed more sensitive for Harry than any other. 
on the security element, I never thought that I would have my security removed because I was born into this position and I inherited the risk. Mm -hmm. So that was a shock to me. Going back to Diana's death, paying for security will be something that Harry feels passionately about, that they need that security, that without that security, their lives are in danger. So you can see how this issue is one of great emotion for Harry. Harry's frustration with his father was clear. Could Charles be doing more for his son? They have stepped down. So I think that to justify, again, Prince Charles paying for that security is difficult. Had they stayed in this country as working members, working senior members of the royal family, we'd be in a completely different situation right now. As father-son rifts go, royal status adds unique complications. The public nature of this feud only makes matters worse. But even after Harry's shocking claims, Prince Charles again remained silent. Harry knows very well that the, the Queen, his grandmother, aged nearly 95, um, and his father, who has followed in her footsteps, believe in the motto, never complain, never explain. So he would know absolutely that they couldn't come back um, and say what the truth was or give even their side of the truth. But we know that in private, he has let it be known that he felt very let down by the interview. After the interview, Gail King, who has become a close friend of Harry and Meghan's, she said on her morning show that Harry had spoken to his father and his brother after the interview, but talks have been unproductive, which I think only really added fuel to the fire. William and Charles thought, whatever I say to him, we now have to be very careful because we can't trust him to keep it private. The claims that Harry made about his father could have a serious effect on the monarchy, which Charles has worked so hard to protect. It can be damaging. That's the reality. That interview overnight could have, could have changed the public uh, opinion of, of the family. <laughs> of course, Harry wants to protect his family, his wife and his child and his unborn child. But at what expense? Is it at the expense of bringing down his own fam, his own, you know, family that he's known for 36 years? In the midst of his many grievances, Harry made an emotional admission to Oprah Winfrey of his hope for a reconciliation. Of course, I will, I will always, I will always love him. But there's a lot of hurt that's happened, and and I will continue to to make it one of my priorities to try and heal that mm. relationship. With the recent passing of the Duke of Edinburgh, could the shared loss in the family become an opportunity? Before the Duke of Edinburgh's funeral, Harry wrote Charles a letter. Charles is a prolific letter writer and actually prefers letter writing to all other methods of communication. And Harry wrote Charles a letter. I think partly apologising for Oprah, but I think wanting to explain. From Harry and Meghan's point of view, they felt that none of the royal family were listening to them. That was partly one of the reasons they had to literally walk away. And of course, at the Duke of Edinburgh's funeral, that was the first time that, that William and Charles had, had seen Harry for an entire year. I think you could see clearly at the funeral how emotional Prince Charles was. He seemed to be more willing to show that side of himself, that raw emotion. And I do wonder if part of that was the problems with his relationship with Harry. The Prince of Wales, I think he's anxious, like any father, to, um, to put right what is wrong. He is a very caring person. Uh, I witnessed that firsthand when I was working with Diana. Whatever protocols he abides by, which he does, of course, he will have a, 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 an undying desire to make sure that his children are safe and happy. Charles's last-minute decision to break with protocol and have his family leave the chapel walking side by side rather than being driven 
seem to be a positive step in rebuilding bridges. I think that this was probably done to try to force some conversation and perhaps repair some of those relationships that we know are not thriving at the moment. We're told Harry and William haven't spoken for a year. The cameras pictured them continuing talking, Harry and, and William all the way back up to Windsor Castle and then the, the feed cut. And we're told that Charles also spoke to Harry, his younger brother, and to William when they were in the quadrangle of, of Windsor Castle. But I'm told that yes, the three of them did talk and it was kind of baby steps to repairing those fractured relationships. Well, it is often said that funerals are moments of reconciliation and that is a sight, let's be honest, that many people really wanted to see not least those in the family themselves. Whether that's just a starting point to fix the relationship will, of course, depend on what happens behind closed doors. After all that's happened, can the bond between Harry and Charles ever be repaired? Emotionally, they seem worlds apart, and I think it's going to take a lot of work from both of them to try and find common ground where they can communicate as father and son. But what I saw from Harry was a lot of deep-rooted pain that may go back quite a long way. There is a need, in a way, to reach the point where, where Harry can forgive Charles for all the turmoil of his, Harry's early years. And it may be that that Harry needs the distance of being in America, um, not being a royal who works as a royal. He may need that in order to reach the point where he can forgive Charles. Like with any relationship, relationships can be repaired with a lot of hard work and, to be honest, a lot of time. And I think in this case, a lot of time is going to be needed.